Hello friends, welcome back to Endo Tales from Life. Thank you so much for your support for our first tale. Uh, it really encourages to do more. And today we have come back with the second endodontic tale from our life. Yes, it's about non-vital bleaching or walking bleaching. Thanks to my friends for giving me opinion or, uh, or recommending me to do on this. Yes, it's a very interesting aspect, but not very popular among uh, the clinicians, I would say, at least in this part of the world. And this is not a common uh, treatment option that uh, many provide in their clinic for a discolored uh, necrotic tooth. But walking bleach or non vital technique is considered as one of the most conservative aesthetic procedure and the procedure that can give you the most the highest aesthetic outcome. Uh, it's such a simple procedure but often not very popular so that's why we chose this for our second tale and yes here again we are going to uh, describe this procedure in a very interesting story story format for you. So here we go. The non-vital tooth bleaching technique or the walking bleach technique as it is popularly known as is one of the most simplest aesthetic procedure to be performed in one's clinic and in fact it is one of the most conservative aesthetic procedure as well. Yes, compared to other interventional treatment like a veneer or a full coverage crown, the walking bleach technique is very conservative as preserves 100% of tooth structure. As you can see in this situation, there is a left maxillary central incisor that has turned necrotic and discolored. To treat this by any other modalities like a veneer or a full coverage crown, one needs to remove some tooth structure and at the same time, the aesthetic outcome can be extremely challenging in terms of, uh, in terms of mimicking the morphology, the color, the surface texture, etc. So most of the textbooks actually, in fact, tell you that a veneer for a single tooth is a relative contraindication as matching the shade surface texture can be an extreme challenge. At the same time, comparatively, when you do a simpler aesthetic procedure and a more conservative procedure like a walking bleach, you are retaining the original tooth's morphology, the color, I mean the contour, the surface texture and also bringing back the original color to the tooth. So it is extremely conservative at the same time also the highest aesthetic outcome. But the biggest fear when it comes to these non vital bleaching technique among all of us is the complication called the external cervical resorption. In fact, most of the people are scared to do this procedure fearing this complication or due to the lack of knowledge regarding the clinical technique. So let us clear this myth and yes, it can be avoided this uh, complication called the external cervical resorption can be easily avoided and still predictive bleach can be achieved in almost every scenario. How is this possible? This is the most important aspect of this video I would say you which is called the cervical barrier technique. So listen carefully here. We need to do something after a routine endodontic procedure before we start the non vital bleaching. Number one is removing GP below the CEJ or the cement enamel junction. Uh, 2 to 3 millimeter below the cement enamel junction so that a cervical barrier can be placed with a respirative material like a glass enamel or composite. Okay, so this 2 to 3 millimeter of the cervical barrier, which is slightly 1 millimeter above the CEJ or the epithelial uh, attachment level of the tooth of the gingiva to the tooth. So, this cervical barrier is very crucial because it will protect the open dentinal tubules so that my bleaching material will not disseminate through the dentinal tubules to the periodontium which is one of the reason for this external cervical resorption. So by placing this cervical barrier we are completely preventing the chances of the tooth developing this complication. So clinically how do you do this? You need to use your obturation pen or you need to use gate skeleton drills. You need to remove some amount of GP below the cemento enamel junction. You can confirm this with the help of a radiograph. Following that, you can place either a glass enamel or resin modified glass enamel or a composite with an universal adhesive. 
The only thing that you need to know is once you place this barrier, it should not be flat. Because when you are placing a flat cervical barrier, there can be some some amount of uh, dentinal enamel junction that can be, st I mean, the dentinal tubules that can still be open. So my cervical barrier should also mimic the external outline of the cement enamel junction. It should be a concave surface. It's called the bossel tunnel appearance or the bossel tunnel shape. Okay, this can be easily achieved with the help of a hand instrument uh, to condense the composite before curing or the glass enamel before it sits. The next thing that you need to know is what are the materials that can be used for bleaching a non vital tooth. Yes, we need to know about sodium perborate and hydrogen peroxide. These two can be either used together or also independently. Right? So the earlier techniques what were recommended in the earlier literature recommended mixing sodium perborate with hydrogen peroxide. So sodium perborate is something which is not easily available for us. So thanks to one of my uh, participants in our WhatsApp group who came up with this idea who found that the denture, uh, the, the denture cleaning tablets also contain sodium perborate but here it contains monohydrate whereas here you can see that it is trihydrate. So there is a study in the uh, literature which compared sodium perborate, monohydrate, trihydrate, tetrahydrate and proved that all of them are effective for bleaching. So it doesn't matter. So uh, uh, logically speaking, even a denture cleaning adhesive, I mean tablet can be broken into powder and used. But I'm not sure about the predictability and I have not used it personally. Right? So this was the original composition that was recommended to mix uh, sodium perborate and hydrogen peroxide into sandy consistency which is 1 gram powder plus 0.5 ml liquid but later studies uh, found that when you mix both hydrogen peroxide and sodium perborate there is going to be a lot of pressure generated and uh, the chances of uh, uh, cervical resorption can also be slightly higher and they found that the efficiency of bleaching was not greater compared to sodium perborate alone when it's used with saline. So today if you are going planning to do a bleach, you can simply use sodium perborate powder mixed with distilled water or if you still particular that you need to some amounts of hydrogen peroxide, you need to dilute the hydrogen peroxide from 30% to 3% hydrogen peroxide and mix it together and that can be used as a bleaching material. So as I told you earlier, sodium perborate can be used separately or hydrogen peroxide also can be used separately. So we also have a ready-made product uh, from Ultradent uh, which is what I use, uh, Opalescence Endo. So there, is, there are no uh, hard and fast rule that one bleaching material is better than the other, not at all. So this, I just use it because of the convenience in the way it is available. So uh, an Opalescence Endo is available in a syringe form which can be easily uh, placed inside the pulp chamber. This is 35% hydrogen peroxide with some thickening agent. So let's go to the clinical technique without wasting much of time and uh, in this uh, simple uh, explanation you'll know what uh, how we do this procedure step by step. So we have a 2-1 our left maxillary central incisor that is necrotic. So first we initiate endo, we complete the endo part and two things like I told you in the beginning, uh, sharing GP below the cement enamel junction is important and number two achieving a cervical barrier with either a GAC or a composite but the shape of the barrier is also important you need to achieve a concave shape that will mimic the external CEJ. So this is how we shear the GP first below the CEJ and then I place a cervical barrier which I condense and after this it's very important for you to etch the pulp chamber on the internal aspect with uh, uh, phosphoric acid that is 1% phosphoric acid so that the debris smear layer and uh, everything is removed, your dental tubules are opened up. This is a very important step for a bleaching agent to effectively penetrate deeper. You don't need any heat application that is no longer recommended. So this step is important that is etching. Followed by that you can place the bleaching material of your choice. It can be either sodium perborate mixed with saline uh, or a lower concentration of hydrogen peroxide. You can make it into sandy consistency and place it here. If not, I have personally used uh, 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 opalescent endo here which is an injectable form just placed it and over this you can again place uh, uh, literature says you can place cavity, you can place glass enamel or composite but I personally believe 
a temporary filling is generally definitely not recommended because there is going to be some amount of pressure generated when this uh, bleaching material is going to dissociate. So a glass enamel is much easier because placing a composite over a wet material is not practically possible. So you can place a glass enamel and apply a little bit of finger pressure so that uh, the glass enamel is going to seal the pulp chamber making sure it holds enough of bleaching material inside the pulp chamber. And in one week this is the kind of result we get. And generally there is no uh, specific uh, time duration that within a week you have to achieve this much of result. Literature says you can go up to two to four visits. So every week once you can keep changing the material, you can go up to four weeks or, or four times you can repeat the procedure till you want to achieve a desired result. So it's unpredictable. Some cases you get the desired result very quickly whereas in some cases it takes some time and in some cases it's going to be more resistant. And the next question comes about the longevity of this bleaching, isn't it? So do you think there is going to be rebound? No. So studies have found that bleaching, uh, non-vital bleaching technique uh, can have a good amount of success rate. In fact, five-year follow-up showed that up to 80 to 85 percent of the cases still did not rebound. As in my own personal follow-up, you can see in one year, there is no reversal of shade at all. And the lesion is also healing and we don't see any evidence of external cervical resorption developing. So it's a very predictable one. So I use it very frequently in my practice. You can see in this case again, there's a 2-1 uh, the patient is not very particular about this particular old patient. So all she was concerned about was getting her 1-1 one -one corrected for which I may give a crown. For 2-1, we have just planned at non-vital bleach and within one week we were able to achieve this result and this is another case. Uh, where in the maxillary left central incisor uh, we were able to achieve fantastic results in just one week. So non-vital bleach procedure is a very reliable, predictable, conservative method which each one of you can follow in your practice. So for more reading, for more details you can refer this article, it's a fantastic review article uh, which will talk about in depth about every aspect of bleaching. So it gets a good read and if, you, if I can even share this article with you, you can send me, uh, if you can contact me by mail or any other way. So thanks for again watching the second tale of uh, uh, the endo tales from life. Get in touch with me in any of these ways and keep listening to our stories about endo. Thank you. We'll be coming up with more such endo tales from life soon.